good morning and welcome. We're so glad that you are here joining us for worship today. If you're online, we'd like to welcome you as well. Please join us as we sing. Let's stand together this morning. the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. And come, just as you are. Amen. Welcome. And ready or not, New Year 2021 is here. Amen. And we welcome you this morning. Thank you for joining us and being a part of this first Sunday of the brand new year. And those joining us online, we welcome you. I hope that you had a wonderful uh, couple weeks of uh, holiday time with family and friends. I know some of you are uh, just getting back from trips and things, and we thank you for being part of this morning's service. And uh, we had a great time with our family this last week and a couple days off here and there. And I hope that you got to enjoy some of that as well. Brand new year, uh, big things ahead for Bible Baptist Church as we look into this new year. And I saw a quote, saw a quote from Alistair Begg, the pastor up there in Cleveland. Uh, he said, the pessimist looks down, the fearful look around, but the child of God's always looking up. Amen? And so we're looking up this year to good and better things than even we've experienced this last year. And so uh, we want to dedicate this new year to our Lord and Savior. The year of our Lord, 2021. Let's get started with prayer, and we want to welcome guests and friends and family. I know some of the Evans family here today and uh, others uh, coming later in the uh, afternoon or the later service. And the evening service, a special time tonight, this uh, 5 o'clock. I guess that's an evening service. It's almost an afternoon service. But uh, I had a bulletin given to me last week from this church 60 years ago in uh, 1961. And their evening service, believe it or not, was at 7.30 p.m. I'm glad we've moved it up, aren't you? <laughs> but tonight at 5 o'clock service, we're going to be uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper. We'll share more details about that special way that we're going to administer that tonight but I uh, hope that you'll be with us. Let's get started with prayer as we get back to the music and the special Lord's Day, the first Sunday of the brand new year. Father, thank you for our time together in your house. Thank you for each and every family that is here and those that will be coming in later services. 
uh, throughout the day. We pray, Father, that your spirit would meet with us in a powerful way. And Lord, as we set the agenda and set our sights on a brand new year, uh, Lord, we want it to be a year of spiritual growth, uh, a year of soul winning, uh, a year of drawing families uh, closer to you. And help us as a church, Lord, to envision those things and to put those things into practice uh, that we might have a, a great year ahead, Lord. It could be the year uh, that Jesus comes again, and we want to be found ready, and we want to be found uh, serving, and we want to be found, Lord, uh, uh, serving acceptably uh, in your sight. Uh, and Lord, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We dedicate this day to you, this service, and we ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. As we uh, look back at the, uh, the old year, 2020, and look forward to the new year, let's remember as Christians we have a sure and steady anchor, amen, that we can depend on, look forward to, and trust in. Christ is sure and steady anchor. Let's sing together. Christ is sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me And my sails have all been torn In the suffering, in the sorrow When my seeking hopes are few I will hold fast to the anchor It shall never be Christ the sure and steady anchor While the tempest rages on When temptation claims the battle And it seems the night has won Deeper still then goes the anchor Though I justly stand accused I will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be removed. Christ the sure and steady anchor Through the floods of unbelief Hopeless somehow, oh my soul, now lift your eyes to Calvary. This my ballast of assurance, see his love forever proved. All my hope is in the anchor, it shall never be removed. Christ the sure and steady anchor As we face the wave of death When these trials give way to glory As we draw our final breath We will cross that great horizon Clouds behind and life secure And the calm will be the better for the storm that we endure Christ the shore of our salvation ever faithful ever true we will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be As we sing this last song, will you stand with me? All I once held dear, build my life upon All this world reveres and wars to own All I once thought gain, I have counted loss Spent and worthless now compared to this. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my goal, you're the best, you're my dream. 
Enjoy my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. And now my heart's desire is to know you more, to be found in you, and known as yours, to possess by faith what I could not earn, all surpassing gift of righteousness, knowing you, Jesus, knowing you. sufferings to become like you in your death my Lord so with you to live and never die knowing you Jesus knowing you there is no greater thing you're my goal you're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my goal, you're the best, you're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you. I love you, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. You met me in my despair to show me that you would never leave me there you claim because I was made for so much more I am your child and I'm worth fighting for though heavy with the weight of my mistakes you carry me and refuse to let me sink under the pressure you're meant for me to soul i am your child and i'm worth fighting for eyes have been seen ears have been heard all you have planned for me and nothing could separate me from your love when there's so much more Still worth fighting for Now I'm moving By faith and not by sight Towards victory By the power of your might You straighten out my path You open every door I am your child And I'm worth fighting for No no, and nothing, no, nothing separate me from your love. Yes, Lord, eyes have been seen, ears have been heard. All you have planned for me. Separate me from your love. And that's why I'm pressing towards the mark. Because the calling on my life is worth fighting for. And I keep my mind 
stayed on you, Jesus, because the peace it brings is worth fighting for. And I'll be faithful to my wife and children because my family is worth fighting for. No, this world is not my home. But your kingdom here is worth fighting for. I got a mansion over in glory. And my new home is worth fighting for. Till I see it, I shout hallelujah here. Cause my praise is worth fighting for. Eyes have been seen. Ears have been heard, there is so much more fighting for. Eyes have been seen, ears have been heard, there is so much more fighting for. There is so much more still worth fighting for. Amen, Kevin. Great song to start out the new year. Amen. There's a lot worth fighting for as we're in this spiritual battle, and uh, appreciate that song this morning. In just a moment, we'll stand and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you want to go ahead and find your place there. Don't have to stand just yet, but I uh, wanted to share kind of a, kind of a uh, outline of the year ahead. And um, hope again that you had a great weekend. I know some more folks have joined us from the original greeting. And I went to the closet this morning to get dressed, and I thought, what should I wear this first Sunday of the year? And for some reason, I was drawn to these Ohio State colors. I'm not sure why, uh, but if you'd have kept a quarterback, you could also enjoy some of those colors. But anyway, I hope you had a good weekend, Ben Williams. You probably did not, but that's all right. It's all right. We had a lot of fun, and uh, we uh, were with some folks and, and enjoying the New Year's Day. Well... As we look out this brand new year ahead, uh, 2021, and you know, this could be the year, amen? I know preachers say that every year, but one of these years, it's going to be the year. <laughs> we say it every year, but even so, John said, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I mean, the Jews, the uh, Israelites were waiting. They said, this could be the year Messiah comes, and there was a year when he was born, and we New Testament Christians say, this could be the year. And there's going to be a generation somewhere along the way, if it's not my generation, my kids, and maybe my grandkids, but somebody's going to hear that trumpet sound. Somebody's going to see the skies lighting up in the east, and we're going to be out of here. And then it won't matter what happens. And I'm thankful that this week is the election and no more commercials. Amen. Amen. We can all agree on that. don't care who you're voting for. Well, one of these days, we're getting out of here, but as we enter this new year of 2021, the Holy Spirit has led me and impressed upon me to lead our church into a renewed love for God's Word and a renewed and refreshed commitment to the doctrines of Scripture. In this last church age that we find ourselves in before the rapture, this last church age known as the Laodicean church, and we are, we are up to our necks in this Laodicean church age. But the church at large in that Laodicean age is marked by a dramatic shift away from the headship of Christ and by connection then, a movement away from the Word of God. Those two are, are forever intertwined. You can't move away from Christ and stay close to the Word of God. And again, you cannot move away from the Word of God and stay close to Christ. Because the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the Word. John 1 verse 1 tells us, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
So when a church moves away from the Word, they are moving away from God. And when a church moves away from God, they are moving away from His Word. And that's how you explain pastors today saying that the Bible somehow supports abortion. To come to that conclusion, you have moved away from the Word of God. Or gay marriage or uh, some of these other social issues to somehow uh, infer, infer that the Bible supports these things, you have long ago moved from this thing of sound doctrine. By contrast, the Philadelphia church, of which we would identify, that's the sixth church age, right before the Laodicean church, the sixth church age, you would find the church of Philadelphia has been complimented by the Lord for a couple things. And if we have those verses, so whoever's running the buttons back there, Notice Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3. I'm a little bit out of order, guys. Thank you. Notice what Jesus said to this church of Philadelphia, of which we would identify as a Bible-believing doctrinal church. He said to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. Verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Look at verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. So Christ compliments this Philadelphia era church, and he says they have a little strength, and he commends them for two things. He says, first, you have kept my word, you've kept my word. And you've not denied my name. And so as we said earlier, when you move away from Christ, you move away from the Word. When you move away from the Word, you move away from Christ. And the Philadelphia church, the hallmark of that church, that era of churches of which we would identify, are churches that have kept the Word and not rejected or denied the name of Jesus Christ. It is the name above all names. Amen? No other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so we're living in an era where theology has been replaced by psychology and the opinions of men. Where Christ has been replaced with whatever's cool. Where fundamentals of the faith have been exchanged for the current spiritual fads. And where the truths of Scripture have been ignored for the trends of society. That's where we find ourselves going into 2021. But we need God's Word. Amen? Notice Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus is speaking, but He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Apostle Paul warned that in the last days people would reject sound doctrine. Look at 2 Timothy 4. Keep going. 2 Timothy 4. Paul warned us, he said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering." and what's the next word? Doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and shall, be tur- shall turn away from their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So now we have this emphasis, Paul said, on sound doctrine. He said, take heed to doctrine And then particularly, he said, there's going to be a time when they reject sound doctrine. But let's define those two words of sound doctrine. Let's define those two words. The first word is doctrine that we will look at. It's from the Latin word doctrina. That's real easy, isn't it? (laughs) Doctrine. You know Latin. How about that? And I'm not talking about pig Latin. I'm talking about real Latin. It's from the Latin word doctrina, which means teaching or instruction. And our Webster's Dictionary says this, it's a codification of beliefs or a body of teaching of instruction, principles, or positions. Biblical doctrine examples would include the Trinity, that's one of our doctrines, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, would include the virgin birth of Christ, which we just celebrated at Christmas time, would include the atonement for sin, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, etc. These are cardinal doctrines, these are sound doctrines Uh, of the beliefs and teachings of the Scripture. And then the word sound is an adjective. Now, we think of sound as a noun. I heard the sound. But the word sound here is used as an adjective. And it means free from flaw 
or defect or decay. It means reliable. Sound means thorough. It means healthy or free from damage. If I'm the captain of a ship, I want it to be a sound ship. Amen? (laughs) Free from decay. My dad was a big proponent of wooden boats. He said if God had wanted fiberglass boats, he'd have made fiberglass trees. But if I'm in a wooden boat especially, I want that boat to be sound, healthy, without decay, reliable. If I'm taking a road trip across the country, I want the engine of my vehicle to be sound. I don't want it to be making sounds. Amen? I want it to be sound, reliable, thorough. Check this thing out. As Americans, we would love for our government to make some sound policy decisions. If I'm on trial, I want my attorney to make sound arguments. Amen? So you understand the definition of the word. To have sound doctrine means to be right, to be thorough, to be healthy, to be without flaw and without decay. So it is very telling that there is a shortage of sound doctrine found in the churches in this last days, as Paul describes it. Now would you stand with me and find 2 Timothy. Guys, we're going to go to the very beginning. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And notice verse 14. Paul's writing, Paul the elder pastor is writing to this young preacher named Timothy, and he gives him these instructions. And to our knowledge, this is the last book that Paul wrote before he died for the gospel's sake. And we find these words, he said, But continue thou, verse 14, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. The first thing on the list. The first thing that Paul said the scripture is good for. Doctrine. For reproof. For correction. For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. Doctrine. The message this morning is building on sound doctrine. Several times a month, and this has been over the course of 25 years of pastoring, but several times a month I receive in the mail... Uh, when we get mail. You all have a problem with mail lately? I receive letters, flyers, brochures, invitations to seminars or new books that promise how we can build and grow the church. They suggest so many things. They suggest so many things, and I've shared some of these before with you. From no suits and ties, that'll build your church, to no choir, to no pulpit. The preacher's supposed to sit up here on a bar stool. You must have a coffee bar in the lobby. You must change your Bible. You have to have a cool name that sounds more like a health club than a church. As a matter of fact, don't even use the word church in your title. And never, ever, ever use the name Baptist if you want to grow a church today. That's what they tell you. Don't receive an offering Only have worship on campus and use small group meetings in homes throughout the week. No Sunday school, no organized youth programs. These are some of the suggestions. But in over 20 years of getting that kind of junk in the mail, I have never seen or heard or read anyone suggesting that to build the church you need to preach sound doctrine. Did you catch that? That's not on the list. As a matter of fact, they would pull away in this Laodicean age. They would seek to water down the doctrine. But I believe God's Word. And I believe that preaching and teaching sound doctrine will build a stronger church than changing our sign. Preaching sound doctrine will build a stronger church than me changing my wardrobe. 
Preaching sound doctrine will build a stronger church than removing the pulpit and opening a coffee bar. Although I did think of a good name for a coffee bar in a church, Holy Grounds. I mean, if I was going to do it. I'm sure somebody thought of it before me. But I think preaching sound doctrine is far superior to any plan or scheme of man when it comes to building a church. You must build the church. You know why this church is here 65 years later? Because it was built on sound doctrine. Think about all the fads and things that have gone through the last 60 years. And, and all, the, all the bright lights and, and all, the, all the new things and all the, the special ideas and, and like a, a dog looking at a squirrel, you know, everything, let's go this way, no, let's go that way, let's do this, let's change that, let's, let's uh, do away with that. No, sound doctrine has kept our anchor and that's why we're here today, some 65 years later. You don't build a church on the music program because music changes. The music we're singing today is not the same that we were singing 30 years ago or 50 years ago. You don't build a church on the preacher because preachers come and go. If this church was built on Dr. Hodges, it would have shut down when Dr. Hodges left. If it was built on Pastor Hubbard, it would have shut down when Pastor Hubbard left. But the church isn't built on personality. It should not be built on personality. But, oh, you see it. You see it all over the country. Popular preacher, huge crowd. Preacher leaves or preacher quits. Preacher retires. That's what happens to the church. Oh, it goes down. Why? Because it's built on personality. You don't build a church on programs. You see, all of that stuff, the, the sound doctrine is the foundation of the church is what I'm trying to teach you. Everything else is window dressing. Everything else is the furnishings of the house. From the staff members, to the programs, to the music, that's all incidentals. But the house must be built on sound doctrine. Because staff members change. Music changes. Preachers change. But the Word of God never changes. And so the foundation is sure and settled, and we need the Word of God. And in this new year, I want to refocus our efforts, not that we've strayed from it, but I want to just put a new commitment to it, that we must preach the Word correctly, consistently, and confidently. Each Sunday morning this year, Lord willing, uh, I'm going to share a little bit about every book of the Bible. Every week we're going to take a book of the Bible. Some weeks we'll double up a couple books, the smaller ones, and just touch on those before I get into the main message. And we're going to go from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to review the major themes and the doctrinal importance of every book of the Bible. As the Bible said, every word of God is pure, and all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so I'm going to add that to our message. Now, don't get, me, don't get worried. I'm not going to lengthen the message. You're welcome. But I'm going to carve out a little time in the beginning of the message to share with you some doctrinal importance of every book. There's no accident about this book. Every book in this Bible is there for a reason. It's there on purpose. All Scripture, A-L-L, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. And so this morning we're going to start, we're going to, uh, talking about doctrine, next week we'll start with these books of the Bible. But I also want to challenge you as we get started this morning to read God's Word daily this year. Some of you I know, I've gotten some emails and some calls, people who've read the Bible through uh, from cover to cover, that's commendable. Uh, many a Christian's never done that in their life. And however you do that, if you choose to read it from Genesis to Revelation or you want to find different Bible reading plans, there's apps for all of that, how you can read your Bible through in a year, I want to encourage you to do that. Whether you read it in a guided reading calendar or you just read it in daily devotions, whether you go all the way through, uh, but, but get a little bit of God's Word every day in this brand new year. Amen? You say, well, preacher, it's the third and I haven't done it yet. Well, you got two days to make up, but you can do it. 
and get a little bit of God's Word. Renew your commitment this year and your love for the Word of God. So what is the importance of sound doctrine? Now I'm going to preach. What is the importance of sound doctrine? Number one, why do we need sound doctrine? Because it produces strong disciples. Sound doctrine produces strong disciples. Weak doctrine produces weak disciples. If you're in 2 Timothy 3, look at verse 16 again. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's it's valuable. It, It does something. It accomplishes something. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. After Paul establishes that all Scripture is given by inspiration, and the word there, inspired, means to the breath of God. We use the same kind of root, respiration. Somebody's, somebody's breathing their lungs. Respiration. We would say if someone's lungs weren't working, they expired. There's that same idea of breath. The Word of God has been breathed by God, and once he establishes where it came from, he says it's profitable, and he lists those four products, and the first one is doctrine. You see, solid Bible teaching and preaching strengthens every believer and provides the knowledge that we need for spiritual battle. And friend, we're in a spiritual battle. It is raging all around us. And whether you recognize it or not, I, I've, I've shared it, especially before the election and during this COVID uh, crisis. Uh, yes, uh, there's political uh, things behind all this. Yes, there's medical things behind all this. Uh, yes, there's economical things all behind this. But there is spiritual things all behind this. And we're in the middle of it. And so Paul says that Scripture is important, that doctrine is important and that through the Word of God, a man may be complete. That word there means perfect. Uh, the, the, excuse me, the word perfect there means complete. It means finished. It means without lacking. And so the man of God has everything he needs in the Word of God. That's why Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's why a Christian who is, is devoid of any Scripture and any taking in of the Word of God is lacking something, okay? If, if I eat three meals a day... Uh, That's good for my physical health. If I exercise, that's good for my physical health. If I read, that's good for my mental health. But if I don't read the Word of God, I'm missing out on my spiritual health. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So for my faith to grow, my intake of the Word of God must grow. The more I know about the Bible, the more faithful I can be to the one who saved me. Sound doctrine is the meat and potatoes of our faith. I like meat and potatoes. Amen? I, they talk about this quarantine, you're gaining weight. Well, I haven't even been quarantining, and I still gained weight. So I don't know what the problem is. But I like meat and potatoes. There's a Michael Finley, one of our pastors, his brother-in-law had a catering business up in Ohio, and they had this special dessert called Orange Fluff. And I think all it was was whipped cream with orange dye in it or something. I mean, it was just, there wasn't much in it. And it was great. And I could eat a plate full of it. It was kind of like Chinese food. An hour later, you're hungry. You know what I'm trying to say? But you get some beef and potatoes in you. That'll last you a while. Larry, you're taking me this week. Longhorns, you name the day. Amen. I'll drive you by. How about that? No, the Word of God is the meat and potatoes of our faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Without sound doctrine, listen, our churches may be filled, but they'll be filled with empty people. Let that sink in for a minute. What good is it to have a a filled house if the people are empty? If the people are hungering for the Word of God? No, through our teaching, through our Awana, through our Sunday school, through our Wednesday nights, through our preaching in the pulpit, we must be preaching and teaching sound doctrine to fill folks with the truth of God's Word. Sound doctrine builds strong Christians, produces strong disciples. Number two, strong doctrine protects the church. First of all, it protects the church from those without. Doctrine provides clarity of position in our stance on things. Think about that. 
And we're old enough, most of us, to remember a day when, when churches were proud of whatever they were. I mean, and I still feel that way. Man, if you're convicted to be a Presbyterian, then you be the best Presbyterian you know how to be. And if you're convicted to be a Methodist, then you be the best Methodist and you study to show yourself approved unto God and you do the best. And if you're going to claim to be a Baptist, then man, you know what Baptist doctrine is and you learn it and you study it and you follow it and you practice it and you be the best that you can, whatever the Lord lays on your heart to be and to do. And we may disagree on different things, but my, my point is this, we used to know what churches believed. Because you could tell by their preaching what they believed. But now most of the preaching is mush. And you don't know what's in there. Amen? It's like some Heinz 57 sauce. You don't know what you're getting. So, so they don't call themselves Methodists. They don't call themselves Presbyterian. They don't call themselves Church of Christ. Though they're preaching you have to be saved by baptism. But they don't want you to know that. So they don't preach it from the pulpit because they don't want to drive people away. Well, there's a little hint of dishonesty there. Hello? Man, we need to tell it like it is. If they don't want it, that's fine. But don't be dishonest about your doctrine. If you're a Calvinist, I disagree strongly with you, but at least tell people you're a Calvinist, preacher. If you believe in speaking in tongues, the Bible doesn't, but if you do, at least tell people what your doctrine is and try to hide it. Sound doctrine protects the church. Modern preachers say that doctrine divides. That's not true. Doctrine defines. Doctrine defines, it puts the parameters on our school of teaching and on our our, uh, preaching of the Word of God. Not every church teaches the same thing. Not every church believes the same things. Not every pastor believes the same things. As I said earlier, you you may be a pastor running for the U.S. Senate, but you have to go outside of this book to find your position on abortion. It's not in here. And you can call yourself a Baptist, And you can preach to thousands of people. And you can be a rhyming reverend. But you're wrong on the doctrine. Good preaching. You're wrong on the doctrine. Listen, the Bible says that sound doctrine protects the church. It's from without and from within. Sound doctrine says this is where we stand and this is what we believe. You can disagree. You have the right to disagree with what we believe, but you're not going to change our doctrine. You follow what I'm trying to say? You can come to me and say, Pastor, we really love the church, but we think we should be sprinkling infants. No, I've been sprinkled by some infants. I'm not going to sprinkle infants. You know why? It's not in our doctrine. It's not in here. And you can believe that because it's part of your history, it's part of your religious tradition growing up, but it's not Bible doctrine and it's not Baptist doctrine and we're not changing it. The little town I pastored, just people said, why do you get so... I gave them a, a perfect example of why doctrine is so important. Uh, they, they were Baptist in name, but they, they really didn't push a lot of doctrine. They really didn't talk about it a lot. And so what happened is people were attracted to that church that believed all kinds of different things. And the clearest illustration I had was when a, a man, one of the deacons came and told me, he said, you never believe. He said, we, we just had to get out. He, he said that the, a guy came in and he was there for about a year or two. They gave him a big adult Sunday school class to teach. Big class. And so at Sunday morning at 10 o'clock in the adult class, he taught the class, you can lose your salvation. In a Baptist church, he taught that. At 11 o'clock, the preacher got up and preached a message about why you can't lose your salvation. So within two hours' time, people heard two different doctrines. No, sound doctrine protects the church. 
It says, this is what we believe. You don't have to believe that, but this is what we believe based on the Word of God, and we're not changing. The Word of God is sure, and it doesn't change. The Bible says that the church should be in unity. Amen? And without schisms, and without division, and without strife. And so doctrine is that standard that unifies us around our core beliefs and protects the church from false teachers and from wolves in sheep's clothing. It protects the church. It produces strong disciples. Number three, sound doctrine prevents the enemy. Who is our enemy? By the way, it's not one another. Our enemy is the devil. Your adversary, Peter calls him. Jesus said, Simon, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. Boy, that's a blessing, isn't it? That Jesus prayed. I've had some great people pray for me. If, I, if my family was in a dire emergency, there's about 10 people I would call across this country immediately and ask them to pray for me. Because I know that they've got a hold of the altar of God and they've been in the prayer room with God and they're in close contact with the throne room of God. But to know that Jesus himself prayed for you, I'd say he's pretty close to the Father, amen? <laughs> I'd say he's got an inside track. And he said, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you Sound doctrine prevents the enemy, the devil, first of all, from confusing the saints. I learned this in my study on the kingdom of the cults, that a lot of these cults and religious groups go after marginal Christians who really don't know their Bible because they're easily confused. It sounds good to them because they've not been rooted and grounded. You follow what I'm saying? So, so, so a cult can come and knock on your door and can get into a Bible study with, you, with a new Christian or a marginal Christian, even a Christian who's been saved for a long time but has never grown and been grounded, and can be easily manipulated to a false set of beliefs. Sound doctrine helps to fight that. Because Christians, as they grow and learn the Word of God and the truths of the Word of God, they can easily spot the false teaching. They can easily spot the false doctrine. The counterfeit. They can actually see that. But if they don't know doctrine, if they don't know what they believe, they don't know why the church believes it. A preacher asked a man one day, he said, what does your church believe about salvation? He said, well, well, they believe what I believe. And he said, well, what do you believe about salvation? He said, well, I believe what my church believes. And the preacher said, well, what do you and your church believe? He said, oh, we believe the same thing. <laughs> Sound like Abbott and Costello, amen? We're not getting anywhere. Who's on first? And sadly, that's how a lot of Christians are. They're, they're so minimal in their understanding of the deep truths of Scripture that they can be easily swayed, easily maneuvered, and misled. Without sound doctrine being preached and taught, many Christians get confused about things that sound spiritual. Listen, they sound spiritual, but they may not be scriptural. Sound doctrine prevents the enemy. Notice Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are spiritual false teachers out there. There are people who are teaching false doctrine. And Paul says, no, we need to be grounded so that when you hear something new, you can, you can contrast and compare and understand, does this meet the scriptural qualification? Is this true based on the entirety of the Word of God? Or is this just some newfangled thing designed to deceive? You don't have to turn there, but Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9 says that we should not be carried about with divers or different and strange doctrines. You see, the devil wants to put a question mark where God has put a period. 
And he started from the very beginning. Jesus said he was a liar from the beginning. He's a liar and the father of lies. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. And so he comes on the scene in the book of Genesis chapter 3 with a question mark where God put a period. Let me illustrate. God said, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat thereof. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, period. The devil comes along, the serpent, more subtle than any beast of the field, and he says to the woman, hath God said, question mark, hath God said, and so he twists the word of God from the very beginning, from a commandment to a question of their opinion. But the Bible doesn't care about my opinion. Man, you got to get this. I know it's 8 o'clock, but i got to do this again, and I need your help. Please, please don't be insulted. Please, please. I'm trying to, this is a new year, and you've got a, a kinder, gentler preacher coming your way. How many of you believe that? Not one vote. <laughs> I'm done. Don't be insulted by this, because sometimes I say things, and, and I, I think, why did I? I didn't mean it that way, but that's how it sounded. You ever done that? So I'm really working on it. I'm, I'm a work in progress, and I'm not trying to insult you, but listen, God doesn't care about our opinion. He cares about His commandments and our response to those commandments in obedience. So don't put a question mark where God puts a period. And knowing sound doctrine will protect and prevent the enemy. Listen, we need to know what God said, so when the devil questions us, hath God said? Yes. Yes, God said that. I don't even have to think about it. God said it. That's it. Prevents the enemy from confusing the saints and prevents the enemy from conquering the saints. Let me give you a quick example. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Very quickly now. Man, it, it, we've got to go quick. 1 Timothy 6, 10. Notice this example. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know what the enemy did right there? He got some people to believe that they could serve mammon. But what's the commandment? You can't serve God and mammon. No man can serve two masters. So these people that Paul's talking about, they coveted after wealth, they coveted after possessions, they coveted after things, and it took them away from the faith, it took them away from the word of God, and they pierced themselves through with many sorrows. God knows what's best. God didn't hurt them. They hurt themselves by getting away from the doctrine of the word of God. You follow me? They pierced themselves with many sorrows because they ignored or they strayed from the commandments of God. That's just one example. Dire consequences came because doctrine was ignored. Say that again. Dire consequences came to them because Bible doctrine was ignored. They neglected it or rejected it. And how many Christians have experienced harm to themselves, their families, or their testimonies by ignoring the Word of God? And I must hasten, why do we need sound doctrine? And that's our focus this year, 2021. Not that we've strayed from it. Please don't misunderstand. We're just trying to redouble our efforts. We're trying to impart the importance of it so that every family of Bible Baptist Church understands why we believe what we believe and why we need the Word of God. Because we're in a generation that doesn't teach that. You understand that? Our society used to support the teachings of the Bible, even if not in, in, in word, at least in practice. We encouraged families to be together. We encouraged young people to wait until they got married. We encouraged good financial stewardship. We encouraged that. But society doesn't do any of that today. Amen? And so I want to renew, and this is the last point, 
Why do we need sound doctrine? Number four, sound doctrine prepares the next generation. I started this message talking about this could be the year, but if not my generation, maybe my children's generation or my grandchildren. There's going to be a generation that sees the Lord return, and we must prepare the next generation. Go back to 2 Timothy, our main text, chapter 3. I'm going to go very quickly. Verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Isn't that good? From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise and to salvation. So sound doctrine prepares the next generation of Christians. Paul the elder tells Timothy the younger to continue, to keep on going in the things which he had learned and that he had uh, known since a child. And our young people, listen, our young people need to be taught what has proven true for over 2,000 years of church history, not what was just recently invented to appeal to their culture and current society. And this is not a complaint from your preacher. This is a burden from your preacher. I, I have a burden that this generation of young people do not appreciate or understand the Word of God to a sufficient degree. Twenty years of ignoring doctrine, listen, twenty years of ignoring doctrine has left us woefully short of strong Christian homes. Why do Christian couples divorce at the same rate as non-Christian couples? You know that's a pretty new phenomenon. It, it, if you study it, you would see that it follows the trend of churches dropping strong Bible teaching. I've got an article in my office. I'll preach it soon. Alcoholism has doubled in the last 30 years. It follows a trend of when preachers stopped preaching about it. It's led to great Family issues, suicides are up, depression. The only families that alcohol has ever helped are the owners of the breweries. The only families that alcohol has done anything good for. Think about it. Twenty years of ignoring doctrine has left us woefully short of strong Christian homes, young couples raising their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and young single adults who desire to stand for Christ and the Word of God because they've been taught the doctrines of this book. By watering down the Word of God and weakening our doctrines, we've produced a generation that doesn't know the difference between a Baptist and any other denomination. They don't know about hell. They don't know about eternal security of the believer. They don't know about the dangers of Calvinism. They don't know about the rapture or the return of Christ. They don't know anything about soul winning. But far worse, worse than not knowing the difference between a Baptist and a Calvinist and a Methodist, worse than that is we've got a generation that doesn't know the difference between Christianity and any other religion in the world. It's one thing to not know your denomination, doctrine, it's another thing to not know the difference between this and Islam. Between this and Confucius. Amen? And it's not a complaint. It's a burden. It bothers me deeply. And I know it's a sign of the times and it's that Laodicean church, but we can fight against it. It's worth fighting for. Amen, Brother Kevin? I'll give you this example in closing. In Nehemiah chapter 13, you don't have to turn there. But Nehemiah, after he built the wall and after things are going well, he noticed, listen what he noticed. He noticed that the Jewish people had so intermingled with the heathen countries. Listen, you've got to get this. It's a good illustration. The Lord gave it to me. Shazam. The Jewish people had so intermarried and intermingled with the heathen countries and peoples and religions Nehemiah said, I noticed that they couldn't speak the language of the Jews. They had lost their language. They had lost their tradition. They had lost their core. 
And he contended with the leaders about that. And he did some great (laughs) corrective action. You can read it in Nehemiah chapter 13. Here's the illustration. In the absence of sound doctrine and lack of following God's clear word, worldliness on the part of God's people has produced a generation that cannot speak the language. They don't know the book. They don't know it. They don't value it. They don't love it. They don't follow it because they don't know it. And just as those heathen nations caused Israel to stumble, the worldliness and the watering down of the gospel has brought us to a place of weakness. But notice, 2 Timothy 3.15, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Boy, I like that. The word of God is essential to our salvation. Paul said, I'm preaching to you the gospel according to the scriptures, he said. That Jesus died according to the Scriptures. That He was buried and He rose again according to the Scriptures. Paul said it is the Word of God which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's the Word of God that makes us wise unto salvation. Without the law, Paul said, I didn't even know I was a sinner. But the Word of God pointed out my sin The Word of God told me about a Savior, and the Word of God invites me to be saved. It's all here. It told me about my sin. It told me about my Savior, and it invites me to come and be a child of God. It's essential. I want our city to know. I want our city to know that Bible Baptist Church believes and still teaches in sound doctrine. And whether we ever get to a thousand people because of COVID and all this junk or the changing world around us and the persecution against the church that's coming, that doesn't matter to me. The matter, it doesn't matter to me what carpet and chairs and curtains and, and, and staff members and, and that programs, that doesn't matter to me. The, the house must be built on sound doctrine. And that's not going to change. And so the Word of God contains sound doctrine about the love of God for His world, the plan to save the world, His invitation that whosoever will may come, and the gospel message that you can be saved today. These aren't man's teachings. This is doctrine from the Word of God. Last verse, Psalm 89.1. Let's read it together. Psalm 89.1. That's not the one, but let's do it anyway. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever with my mouth Will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations? His faithfulness, his word, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Well, that's how the year's starting out, amen? And I want you to renew and recommit and refresh your love for God's word. You know where we're going. Now get on board and help us. Let's bow in prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes closed, and today as we consider God's Word and we think about this simple message, it's kind of a New Year's message, an opening plan, if you will, of how I feel the Holy Spirit's leading in the teaching and preaching ministries of our church this year. We want to be a blessing, and we want folks to grow. We want to, the, the, the strength of the Word of God to be the foundation of everything that we do and that we are. And as the music begins to play softly, specifically, again, want to say that the Word of God is necessary for salvation. It tells us of our sin. It tells us of our Savior. It tells us the remedy for us to be saved, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And today, if you're in this auditorium or you're watching at home online, the Word of God It's calling you to the cross, to the side of the Savior. And today, if you're not saved, what a great Sunday, the first Sunday of the new year.
to trust Christ as your Savior, to base your life upon His unchanging Word, to guide you. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So today, if you're not saved, I want to encourage you to pray a simple prayer of faith. As you reach up in faith, God reaches His hand down in salvation. Would you reach up in spiritual faith and pray with me? Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I believe your word that Christ died on the cross for my sins. And I believe your word that he rose again from the dead. And today I call upon Christ as my Lord and Savior. Help me, Lord, to trust you, to follow your word, and to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me as Brother Jody leads us just a verse or two. The altar's open. A New Year's prayer, a New Year's direction. Would you come as we sing? Him I could do nothing without Him I surely So much again. Thank you for joining us this first Sunday, the early service, uh, and we're going to continue two services until we get the green light that we can start getting more and more people uh, back to one. I know some of you are getting awful used to the two services, and and we'll keep it going as long as we can. But I'm really praying that we get through these next month or two of winter, and uh, the vaccines get up to where they need to be, and the counts start to come down, and things prayerfully get better and uh, we'll be able to do more events and activities and and we're trying to put a spring program together even now so uh, just stay with us hang in there and we're going to continue with the uh, victory class meeting in here these all this Sunday school from victory hall for the next uh, several weeks at least and we'll keep you updated on that tonight at five o'clock there is no awana program yet they come back next week and so with having everyone together we're going to observe the lord's supper in a safe uh, manner uh, the, the communion cups are all individually wrapped and they're going to be handed out to you by ushers or with gloves and uh, those who are participating are going to walk past you. We're not going to pass the tray and it's going to be a, a different way of doing it, but I'm glad we're able to do it. And so tonight, the Lord's Supper at 5 o'clock uh, in the evening service. There will be nursery available, uh, but there's no other children's program available. This Tuesday, I can't tell you the importance enough of voting if you haven't already done that. It uh, didn't work out for me to go early, so I'm going to have to stand in line on Tuesday. But uh, it's not the church's place to tell you how to vote, but to vote, uh, definitely we want to encourage you to do that. Um, on down the list, Saturday is our men's prayer breakfast. Guys, we're bringing back the full breakfast this Saturday at 8 a.m. in the social hall. And uh, also uh, next Sunday, as I said, we'll get back into some of these um, uh, things that we've been off the, the Iwana and and uh, kids' programs will be back uh, next Sunday night 
uh, as well. Lots more in the bulletin. Uh, grab a copy before you leave. Just a couple weeks from Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, where we support our Coastal Pregnancy Center with the Bottles for Babies campaign, and we'll tell you more about that. You can read about it in the bulletin. Well, let's be dismissed. Uh, Sunday school starts in about five or six minutes, and um, we'll pray for the offering, and you give to the Lord as He's blessed and prospered you. The ushers are available uh, in the back. Let me thank you. I said something last Sunday night, I think it was, uh, but thank you for your great stewardship in this year, and especially here at the end of the year. Um, we've had some tremendous offerings that have really put us in a strong financial position. As a matter of fact, in talking to some of the past leaders and even Pastor Hubbard, uh, we're entering 2021 in a stronger financial position than we've been in many years. And so uh, praise the Lord for that. Amen? It's, and it's because of God's blessings and your faithfulness and uh, we are very, very humbled and grateful by that. So uh, we're going in to a new year. We don't know what's going to happen next year, but we're prepared and, and we're in a good position. So thank you for your giving and your consistency in staying faithful, even in the hard times. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for this first service. We pray for the Sunday school teaching hour and then the late service to follow. And Lord, I pray that you'd bless this offering, the gift and the giver, the tithe portion, as well as the missions and building. Uh, Lord, we are ha happy to report to our people uh, the goodness of your hand upon us this last year, and we look forward, Lord, to continued blessings in the new year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We are dismissed.